Before I get into the specific projects that you are mentioning, I'd like to talk a little bit about our philosophy, philosophy at Kittleson regarding data analytics. Uh, so the way we approach data analytics is to think of it as a way to convert data into information with the ultimate goal of informing decisions. The next slide will show you a little bit more detail on how that goes. Um, it really has to start at the top with asking the right questions. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of data set you have or how sophisticated your statistical analysis is. If you're not answering the right questions, the analysis is really not that useful. So at the very beginning, we work closely with our clients to make sure that the analysis that we're about to do for them really hits the right questions and can then ultimately be used to uh, make better informed decisions at the end. Um, in addition to that, we, we obviously have to look at uh, certain considerations. So uh, the level of detail required of the analysis, uh, the cost of the data uh, that we would need and uh, the shareability or how easy it would be for our clients to, to share the data with other consultants or, or their partners. And uh, when we look at, at these considerations in, in several locations, we've, we've chosen Streetlight as our data source for projects. Um, since it was founded in 2011, um, we have been uh, communicating with them and have started using them back in 2015 for a quarter study here in Orlando. And then as Lane was saying, uh, a series of quarter studies and, and the intersection level analysis uh, since then. But the focus of this presentation is really on our more recent work that we've been doing uh, at the regional with Metroplan Orlando, our, our MPO, and at the state level with FDOT central office. So I'll start with the uh, Metroplan Orlando uh, project. So this is part of their long range transportation plan, which is just called the the Metropolitan Transportation Plan or the 2045 plan. And our work was, was just uh, one small part of, of a much bigger project, but uh, we called it the origin destination analysis and we completed it, it earlier this year. It really boils down to five key questions on origin destination patterns throughout the Central Florida region. Um, so the first one was looking at historical trends. So going back in time, and seeing how origin destination patterns have changed. The second one was on origin destination patterns within our commuter rail system, which is called SunRail. And then the last three uh, were, were based on uh, short trips that are currently made by cars, uh, freight or goods movement, and overall current origin destination patterns. For the last three, we did manage to use uh, street light data. And for the first two, we used other types of data that I could go into in a little more detail. So historical trends, we really wanted to go back uh, as, as much as possible. So we went back to uh, 1990, so about 30 years, to really see how origin destination patterns have, have changed in, in Central Florida. Uh, back then, uh, cell phones either had not been invented or really weren't, were not out there too much. So, so there's really no uh, probe data that we could look to, um, to to get at this question of historical trends. So we ended up turning to the US Census. They keep a county to county commute flow data set going back to even beyond 1990 actually, uh, and visualize that as a series of Sankey diagrams, which you can see here on the slide uh, for 1990, 2000, 2010, uh, and 2016. And the, the scale of these diagrams communicate the population and uh, jobs in the region. So the, the big takeaways for, um, for this analysis is that the region has seen a really rapid growth in population, as you guys here in Florida probably know, uh, but even faster growth in employment. So we're actually uh, importing more workers from neighboring counties now in 2016 uh, as a proportion of all workers than, than back in 1990. And those are coming primarily from Lake County, uh, Volusia County, and Polk. But um, even though that's a pretty neat finding to me, that the bigger picture is that about 70% of workers in the Metro Planet Orlando region both live and work in the same county. So there's still a lot of, uh, of need for intra-county movement that, that we could work on and not just that long distance commute. 
So the second one uh, was an analysis of origin destinations along our single commuter rail line uh, goes uh, basically from south to north through, uh, through central Florida. And we initially considered using Streetlight for this, uh, but it, um, it doesn't natively support transit yet. And we dreamt up a couple of workarounds, but we, ultimately we weren't sure if it was really gonna work or give us accurate data on transit origin destinations. Um, so we instead turn to the SunRail smart card data uh, that comes from tapping on and off as you board the trains. Um, and this arc diagram that we created from it, I, I like to approach it with like a squint test. So if you, if you squint at it, uh, it seems to me like the findings are even more obvious, but what we're seeing uh, along the SunRail line is that the strongest connections in terms of origin destinations are between the central core of stations, uh, mainly Church Street uh, through Winter Park, so this is downtown Orlando and uh, Winter Park, obviously Winter Park downtown, um, between those and the two or three stations at each end of the line. There's relatively little travel between those core stations or travel from one end of the line up to the other. Uh, so what we're really seeing here is that typical commuter into uh, downtown, um, especially from longer distances out. So going now to uh, some of the streetlight analysis that we did as part of this project. Um, so the first one was looking at uh, freight movement uh, and we took advantage of the commercial vehicle specific data that we can obtain from streetlight. We ended up doing a couple maps. Uh, so the one on the left is using all roads in the region and uh, scaling the, the width of the line based on uh, proportional volume. And as you can imagine, those are the ones that stick out the most are limited access facilities, the big freeways, expressway system, and so on. Which uh, of course makes sense, but, but for Metroplan's purposes, uh, they were really interested in seeing uh, what's going on outside of the freeway system. And if there's any uh, major arterials where they can start focusing more on freight movement, so the map here on the right, that shows you uh, what you would get if you exclude the freeways uh, from, the, from the symbology of the map. And uh, now it's popping out the regions where uh, there's a lot of industrial activity and, uh, and warehousing and all that. Another analysis that we did for Metroplan had to do with uh, short car trips. So here we took advantage of the GPS data set that Streetlight had back in this time. And that guy, you know, we talk all the time about corner cases for that GPS data. But this is one where we really wanted to uh, find areas that had a lot of car traffic um, that was doing very short trips. Because we felt that that could be locations where there's uh, latent demand for pet bike travel, or maybe locations where you could uh, benefit from a park once environment where people drive to it, but then within that area they can walk or bike. Um, so surprisingly, when we look at car trips across uh, all three counties of the Metroplan Orlando region and Metroplan as a whole, uh, roughly um, more than half of, of all car trips are less than five miles, which is really not that bad for kind of like a bicycle trip. So we see that there's a lot of potential overall, but then we took advantage of the uh, granularity of the data and really dived into specific areas. So one that um, came out near the top was uh, this kind of broad area between the Millennium Mall, uh, International Drive, uh, Universal uh, Convention Center. So we're seeing a lot of short car trips there, a mile, uh, maybe two, three miles um, that could potentially be served by non-auto modes and relieve some of the really bad congestion that, that happens in that area. Our final question for uh, Metroplan Orlando is really looking at the current origin destination patterns in the region by doing a uh, census block group trip table using street like data. And um, even though this map doesn't communicate kind of the data, you really can't get numbers out of the map. We thought it was a really neat way of using open source mapping libraries to bring the street like data to life. Um, so as I look at this map, I see how spread out our, our travel patterns are within the central Florida region. And even though you see those, those clusters um, at downtown Orlando, Winter Park, the theme parks, of course, the airport, 
there's just a lot of trip making going on throughout the entire region. So it's kind of a, a qualitative way of, uh, and, a, and a visual way of showing uh, how people are getting around the Orlando area. Uh, before I go to the next project, Becca, are there any questions from the Q&A on, on any of the Metroplan stuff? Yeah, Jorge, we did have a question. Um, All right. Two questions, actually. So, Jorge, how, how come you didn't use LBS data for the SunRail analysis for Metroplan? Yes. Um, so one of the challenges um, that we had, we considered first doing um, kind of drawing a zone for the, the platforms to the train and using the LBS data to get origin destination from and to. But as you know, Becca, there's the kind of the five minute rule where the device has to be stationary for five minutes before the trip is considered ended or started. And we weren't sure if somebody just manages to catch a sunrail without waiting five minutes, would they be missing from that data set? So we had a, kind of a lot of questions about what would happen in, in that workaround. And um, when we learned that we had the option of using the the Unreal smart card data, we ended up choosing that instead. Great. Um, another question, uh, this is a very interesting one. What portion of short trips in high congestion areas do you suspect are non-home-based trips? For example, someone who may have traveled to Millennia from their home in Altamont, but, but made a short car trip from Millennia Mall to, Ike to the Ikea. Yeah, I, I don't have that number off the top of my head, but um, I can um, uh, refer and everyone, I can send it to you, the link to the um, technical report that we did for Metroplan Orlando, and I believe we looked at that as well. Uh, we are really interested in both the absolute number and the proportion of short trips being made. But I agree that trip purpose uh, is definitely a worthwhile thing to check out as well. And one more question, Jorge. Could you please tell us the name of the open source library you used to create the map? Yeah, it is uh, Kepler GL. So Kepler.gl, it was originally developed by Uber and then uh, it was open source and lives as an online uh, open source tool that you can use. It's pretty neat. Great, those are all the questions. Thank you, Jorge. Yeah, you're welcome. So uh, the second project I wanted to talk about is really using our uh, pedestrian and bicycle data subscription from FDOT central office to look at uh, the level of activity of pedestrians and bicyclists across different types of roadways. Um, before I get into the uh, specific charts where we use street light, I just wanted to include this to make sure everybody is at least a little bit familiar with our new contest classification system. This is something that, that Kittleson helped FDOT Central Office implement a few years back. Um, but it's really trying to uh, categorize the, all the roads in, in FDOT system according to the land use surrounding it, ranging from the very rural uh, C1, C2 settings to our most densely populated uh, cities over in the C6. Um, as you guys could all imagine, you probably would expect the level of pet and bike activity to go up as you go into the uh, contest classifications to the right. Uh, but that, you know, that without streetlight data, we wouldn't really be able to quantify that because uh, it's just impossible to count pets and bicyclists along every road in, in Florida. Um, so we ended up doing something like this, where we joined our context classification layer with the pedestrian and bicycle activity estimates from Streetlight, and we're able to um, normalize and create a chart showing how pedestrian and bicycle activity does indeed go up as you get to the uh, more dense context classifications. Um, it was interesting to see that the bicyclists don't really pick up until you get to urban center and urban core while pedestrians uh, just have a, a gentler slope with a little bit of uptick here for the rural town setting. Those are just like your, your small town main streets. Um, of course, part of our job is to communicate this data in, in a manner that makes sense to, to the general public. So we end up creating something, uh, a graphic like you see here on the right, uh, just basically telling people this is based on, the, on, on actual data along uh, classified roadways this is generally the level of pedestrian and bicyclist activity uh, that you can expect with C6 having the most peds and then coming down from there with a little bit of a bump for the C2T rural town. 
Uh, and it's not just only for guidance and communication. We actually have started using street bike data to inform some of our systemic safety analysis. And this is where instead of looking for a handful of high trash locations, we actually um, try to identify types of roads that are at most risk for, uh, for crashes um, and then can, can deploy systemic countermeasures for it. Uh, so for a long time, the puzzle pieces that we had were, were really the crash data, uh, the context of the roadway, uh, context classification is a great example of that, and uh, roadway characteristics, with which FDOT does a really great job at keeping. Those are number of lanes, posted speed limit, and such. But we never really had access to a measure of how many people are actually walking or biking out there. Um, and as you can imagine, the more people are out there, the more exposure to crash, right? So with Streetlight and having that um, statewide access, we were able to at least get a simplified version of uh, pedestrian and bicyclist activity level, which is what you see here on the right. Um, if you're from Florida, you probably recognize this as uh, the Miami-Dade region. And we um, end up uh, bucketing all the roadways according to whether they are in the bottom quintile, second quintile, and so on of, of the Streetlight pedestrian index. Uh, and having that puzzle piece in back into our puzzle has really enabled us to to get a lot more refined in the types of roadways and and the context that that we're targeting for systemic improvements. Um, Becca, any questions on the F dot? Yeah, the one question was about your context context class to the bike ped data. Uh, yeah. What was your y axis as part of that? Yes, good question. So um, the numbers behind this are the pedestrian and bicyclist street light index, which are, there's no scale to them really. I think they're just kind of like a made up number that just grows and grows. Um, so obviously that's not something that makes sense to show in a chart so that um, our step to normalize it was to uh, have everything be a percent of the maximum either bicyclist or pedestrian index. So that's why you see a hundred here in C6, and then this means C5 was roughly, I don't know, 65, 70% of what C6 had, and same for, for bicyclists. Okay. Good question. So I, I think if we have another question from the previous dis, uh, analysis, uh, discussion about Metro Plan Orlando. Yeah. Your, your numbers on the car trips by distance look, look a little odd. Are you sure that more than half of the trips are less than five miles? Yes, so um, it is it is a surprising finding, but we have cross-checked that against other uh, national data sets, uh, both survey-based and probe database, and they both tell the same story. So the uh, National Household Travel Survey 2017 version, the median car trip in the U.S. was was only four miles. So that gave us confidence that what we were getting from that trip distance histogram makes sense within the kind of national environment. Great, thank you. All right, so um, looking ahead, uh, as Lane and Becca knows, uh, we're, we're always looking for the, uh, for the next challenge when it comes to the data. Um, the first one really is to keep up with the frequent changes and enhancements that you guys are making to the platform. Uh, second, and I'm looking forward to your presentation, Becca, is to uh, look at ways to analyze COVID-19 impacts. Um, and then finally, to expand the use of Streetlight beyond those quarter level corridor level projects to system levels planning and hopefully traffic operations.